welcome to All Things Policy, a daily podcast supported by Pragati, a flagship media initiative of the Takshashila Institution. We're a bunch of policy nerds based in Bengaluru, and we like to bring a fresh perspective to Indian affairs and an Indian perspective to global affairs. So grab a cup of coffee, sit back, and join us for today's chat. Welcome back to this episode of the All Things Policy podcast. Ashit? Yeah. So, listeners, as we were talking about possible solutions and as Carl asked about the possible solutions, so you have to think about this problem, this supply demand, you can call it a supply demand mismatch from a macro level view. So, there are basically two broad stakeholders. One is the reader who is the consumer of the research and one is the author. They are the producers of the research. So, the reader wants to access research and read so that she can basically build upon her understanding of the subject, make it more better and maybe use that in their research. The author wants as many as people to reach and they want to disseminate their research to a lot of people. So, these are the basic motivations. So, they are around three, four ways that people around Mm -hmm. the world have tried to solve this. So, one is the open access. So, what happens is, this a lot of big journals have done. Instead of charging the reader to read the article, they charge the author. But Mm -hmm. this fees is like a large fees and only a very minuscule percentage of authors can afford to pay this and that too in in developed countries, not in countries like India. And Mm -hmm. so this option is only viable for a small minority of authors. And that too, it is different when you pay, your institution pays for access to a journal. And it is very different when uh, you ask money for being published in the journal. So it is Mm -hmm. very difficult to get uh, access to that kind of money. The second is uh, something which Germany did. They called it project deal. So basically it's a group of 700 universities that made a deal with publishers as a whole basically they are using uh, their bargaining powers as a group so to get a better price and they got a better price there were several conditions with different publishers they wanted to pay certain fee per paper read certain fee per paper published so but this is also like quite expensive and is unlikely and was at least unlikely to happen in india but after the uh, new STIP, the Science and Technology Innovation Policy 2020, mm-hmm. there were talks about this, the government of India are doing a similar sort of like a deal with publishers, but it has not yet materialized, but maybe, maybe they'll do it. But I don't think the government would be able to get access for all the universities at a pretty cheap price. I don't know how the price point will work out for India. The third is yep. piracy sites like SciHub and LibGen. So this is what a lot of Indians use in journal because we cannot afford the thousand of dollars of fees to access a journal. So this is how the process goes. You go to the site and uh, yeah. you put in the link to the paper you want to access. The site while using access credentials of somebody else, which Sihab says people donate their credentials to them, which the person has donated, they get access to the article. So mm you get access to the article for free. I think if maybe the court decides that this is not uh, permissible under the Indian law, it would be quite a impedience to access research. It would be a big blow to Indian research community and Indian researchers in general. No, I just wanted to understand, uh, Harshit, like, is this, so when you access research articles on Sci-Hub, is this more of a paper use model as uh, as we see these days in the applications that we use, uh, our phone applications? Or is it more of a subscription-based model where you, on a monthly basis, you kind of pay for a certain number of articles to, to access or to download, for instance, right? So how are the payment models? Maybe that is one area I think platforms or the publishers can explore is to maybe have a subscription-based model on a monthly basis, which is contextualized in the country that, you know, they are operating in, right? I mean, it doesn't make sense to, say, charge a monthly subscription of $100 or $200 in India 
where the price points are certainly more sensitive so is that something which publishers have explored or like is this again a case of you know just having too much power in this the power asymmetry is quite huge which kind of doesn't give them the incentives to you know make you know wholesale changes in this yeah so uh, the sci hub model first of all it's free so it's basically they are using other people's credentials to get you access to a paper you don't whenever you access sci hub or libgen you don't have to pay any money the publishers uh, i don't think they offer like differential pricing to a lot of journals to country wise mm-hmm. at mm-hmm. least for the journals which i look out for nature or lancet i may be wrong but when i was looking at those papers i did not get a differential pricing there are differential pricing for institutions or for individuals for students but country wise there is no differential pricing as such it obviously it makes sense that you will have you will charge yeah. less price for countries like india but they mm. don't do it and that is why a lot of indians they use third party access to get research because mm. it's like very expensive it's like it runs into 100 of euros and 100 of dollars to access mm. one journal and that is one journal in a plethora of a lot of journals for instance maybe i use 10 15 journals very regularly mm-hmm. so if i want access for that that will run into several lakhs of rupees so i cannot afford to uh, subscribe to those yeah no i think the the point that you made earlier also about you know how these articles at the end of the day goes through that quality check uh, why are these publishers right so when you say that you know the likes of you know those accredited journals where you need to get published if you want to move up the academic sort of ladder so there's certainly a system that is in place which is almost like a vicious cycle right that you you have to access these articles in order to publish your research but at the same time you should be able to publish this research in those journals to have any chance of you know having those academic credentials right which uh, researchers kind of uh, pursue in whatever that they do i think one of the unintended unintended consequences of you know using you say the journal articles that are paywall is that when people don't get to read the entire article or paper they end up reading the abstract right and then that doesn't really give you a full sense of what the article is about right or what what the crux of the maybe it does give you a crux of what the article talks about but by and large it isn't going to be comprehensive enough to include as part of your say research methodology so i mean there are like multiple consequences you know to actually doing research which is not you know kind of comprehensive right and i think that's where maybe the research community across maybe the major universities can maybe take you know a positive step on this front the funny thing is the journals they do not pay the people who do the peer review for instance mm-hmm. kal you are invited to review a paper the journal will get all the subscription money they are not paying to the authors they are not paying you so the gatekeepers are keeping all the money and they are not giving it to you so maybe i don't know maybe we can do this without them maybe better journals will come up which will take only maybe eventually the market will settle down and the price point will come a lot lower recently the us under its open i don't remember what exactly the policy is called i think it's called open science policy they have said that all the research which is done by using the government's money will have to be published in a open journal so it would be yeah. accessible to public because it doesn't make sense so you are paying one side you are paying to get the research done and then you are paying again to access that research so the taxpayer is paying twice for the same research mm. in india they called it one nation one subscription but i don't know what was the end of that were we able to get it out were we yeah. india pushed but i don't think the journals agreed to what the government was proposing the policy mm-hmm. stip policy had something along this nature but mm. uh, i don't think we were able to like get it through so it's like very difficult if for instance if tomorrow sihab closes then a lot of research would come to an halt because if you're not able to access already existing research you won't be able to build upon it so it's the motto of google scholar it says that building upon standing on the shoulders of giants so you build upon the pre- pre-existing knowledge and that is how you 
push sort of the frontiers of science. Mm. If you are not able to access old research, you won't be able to like build upon it, analyze it, do new yeah. research. Yeah. So it's like super difficult. No, I agree with you. I think uh, I think this is where I think the the cases uh, that the publishers uh, kind of went to court, uh, saying that uh, you know, say the Delhi University kind of uh, you know people who would like you know print those readings that would be used uh, for lectures like and, at university. I mean, I myself went to university at uh, Delhi University, and yeah, I mean. it was not possible for a student in his or her undergraduation to be able to purchase a book which is as expensive as the ones that we had to read right so so w- what has been the backlash from publishers in terms of access to these resources at a university level is there any insight that you can draw upon that will potentially have consequences for you know say the academic community yeah i think uh, it was called the uh, du photocopy case and the court determined that it comes under the fair use fair dealings part mm-hmm. of the copyright act and they allowed it so for personal use i think oxford cambridge and a lot of publishers they sued this there was this small small photocopy shop which uh, supplied photocopy course pack to students so basically mm-hmm. uh, you obviously you would have access those so you did have those reading packs you got right mm-hmm. so they sued him and i think he won and now it's allowed for instance if you are copying chapters of books for purpose of education the section mm. 52 it allows you to do that it says mm. that it comes under fair use so maybe because of like lawsuits like this sahab has decided that maybe they have a chance of winning this in delhi instead of uh, fighting the case over in the us mm. no because certainly i think the the issue of you know the larger public good that is at stake here i mean and i think we should be quite uh, upfront about you know this assumption uh, or the premise of this conversation is that i don't think financial constraints should be an impediment to research right i think people who are pursuing research and may not have the financial circumstances to be able to carry out their research is certainly a bad outcome right for uh, for again the community the research community larger society so i think when we kind of look at the larger public good here what is your personal sort of opinion on the use of sci hub right and where do you stand on this kind of debate between affordability versus copyright so i don't think the publishers are justified in charging so much somewhere somehow the issue of copyright comes in and sure. it would be justified if the publishers were paying the peer reviewers or they were paying the authors but nobody gets a penny so mm-hmm. this would be when the research community and when the society realizes that maybe we can bypass the publishers for instance there are preprint servers there is a server called bioxrv where you put preprint papers up and people comment on that and people are able to access that but then the process of peer review comes in so there is no peer review in services like this but i think if sahab or libgen is stopped this would be a devastating loss to at least the indian research community because we don't have access to any kind of research except for sharing credentials or maybe sahab or libgen no i think uh, surely in the spirit of kind of uh, providing this you know public good especially in a country like india where you know you would be kind of starved Uh, of good quality research output if you do not have access to you know uh, the the prime research that is made available you know at a global level uh, but thanks uh, harshit uh, for kind of enlightening us on this topic uh, thank you to our listeners for uh, joining us on this episode today uh, stay tuned for more and uh, yeah we'll be back again with another episode thank you so much for having me If you liked our show, don't forget to check out other interesting podcasts on the IVM network. You can tune into them on the IVM podcast app, ivmpodcast.com, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. You can also follow IVM on social media. The handle is at IVM Podcasts on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. And hey, if you'd like to dive into Takshashila's research on technology, strategy, and economic affairs, check us out at our Twitter handle. at takshashila inst or our website takshashila.org.in